My name is Stanley Soar and I have the great pleasure to sit here with Anders Johansson, professor in astronomy yes. here in Lund University. Mm -hmm. We have been talking about the universe and the stars, both stars here on the earth, mm -hmm. like Tycho Brahe, yeah. which is a big sculpture mm -hmm. down in your beautiful courtyard, yeah. and, and the stars outside us. Yeah. And uh, your specialty is in the formation of planets. Yes. It's it's like you 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 you, you were part in creating two two kids, right? And and uh, you're interested in creating creating planets. Yeah, yeah. Um, could you see similarities there between what we create here on Earth and what is created out, out in space? Yes, I could definitely see that. I think as uh, as an astronomers, we like to think about where things come from. We like to think about the origin of planets, the origin of stars, the origin mm. of of our galaxies. And, and I do see some similarity there, both between, as you say, raising kids, creating mm. at home, also being an artist, creating a piece of art, mm. being an engineer, creating a new car. Mm. I think it's part of our brain somewhere that we like to, to create and create new things. Yeah. yeah. And, and you see a lot of miracles occurring out in, in the depths of space. Mm -hmm. Tell us about some of the beauties. Well, I think uh, it's, a, it's I think it's amazing that we know today that there are planets around most other stars. Mm. If you go back 50 years in time, we thought only the only the sun was gifted with a planetary system, mm. and now, since the discovery of the first planet around other stars that happened 20 years ago, exoplanets, exoplanets indeed, they're called exoplanets. Now we know of more than 5,000 exoplanets, mm. and we also know that 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 all stars are surrounded by their own planetary systems, like the solar system, but different planets. And I think this is an amazing change in our view of the universe now that we know that, that planets are common in the universe yeah. and that they are not unique to our sun. So when you were born, there were only nine planets. Yes. And then it decreased into eight planets yeah, because Pluto was yeah. exhumated yeah. yeah. fr from it. But, yeah. but now it's increasing again. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's an amazing journey throughout your life. I think it is. And, and I think it also shows that how we define a planet in the solar system with mm. Pluto or not Pluto, it, it doesn't matter. There are so many planets out there in, in the galaxy and in the universe, so we have to be very open-minded about what we call a planet and what we don't call a planet. And, and then there were some things coming into our Earth. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm glad I didn't get this one in, in, in my head. Exactly. This is uh, pure it's, iron. It's uh, pure iron and, and nickel uh, meteorite. Yeah. Uh, and uh, meteorites are, 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 are uh, pieces of rock that orbit around in our solar system in the asteroid belt. And uh, they are uh, telling us something about how the solar system formed. Mm. These, these, uh, these objects formed four and a half billion years ago mm. when the solar system formed. And most of these, uh, so you think of these meteorites that they come from, from asteroids, maybe one kilometer or 10 kilometers or 100 kilometers in size. Most of them collided to form planets like the Earth, mm. Jupiter, Saturn. But some of them remained as, as asteroids. And then we are gifted here on Earth that we get these fragments of asteroids falling down as meteorites. Because then we can study those and we can learn something about how planets form. And uh, is there any risk that, that there would be a big hit, uh, impact on Earth? Because in, in Sib Siberia... Yeah. It was a, there was a big catastrophe. Yeah. It happens sometimes, but we actually have very good statistics now since we have mapped most of the asteroids that are near-Earth objects. Mm. So you could say something like uh, what made the dinosaurs extinct, extinct 65 million years ago. That was a 10-kilometer-sized asteroid that, that, that hit Earth. That happens only once every 100 million years. Mm. That's not so often. And like the thing, uh, that the, the, the Tunguska explosion that hit Siberia in the early 20th century, that's something that happens maybe a few, every few hundred years. Yeah. Yeah, so we have very good statistics now for how often you get hit by something of a certain size. Mm. But of course, that's only statistics. So you can still be, be unlucky. Yeah. And suddenly, you, we have a 100 meter sized object coming towards us. And is luck something that is needed when you're in your field of work as well? I think that's true. I think you do need a certain amount of luck uh, to be at the right place at the right time where a new field is maybe opening up. Mm. I think when I was a university student, I was very inspired by, by the discovery of the first exoplanets. So mm. in 1995, the first planet around another star was discovered by, by, by two researchers in Switzerland. And, and for me, this was a very lucky timing in a way because I had an interest in planets already and I was studying physics. Mm. 
uh, and mathematics at the university, and suddenly getting this news about exoplanets meant that I knew what I wanted to, 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 to do research in. And your father was working with physics as well? My, my dad was a physicist, or, or is a physicist. Also. Yeah, so, mm. so, and you grew up... Uh, with a Commodore 64. I grew up with a Commodore 64. Uh, that was the back in the time when you had a little prompt where you had to either load a game yeah. or you had to start programming <laughs> a game. <Yeah. laughs> so that was very inspiring, actually, for, for learning about, about, about programming. And, and, and I always felt that programming was a good gateway into math also. Yeah. It's a logical thinking. Mm. But it's a different logical thinking than math because you get, a, you get an error if you do something wrong. You know what was wrong. But math, sometimes you don't know what you're doing wrong. So mm. I always like the hands-on mm. feeling of, of the programming. It's very kind of applied logics. So you have programming, you have math, and you have mm. physics. And, mm. and all these you kind of use and combine right. into right. astronomy. Exactly, exactly. And particularly with the... My, I have a fascination for, of planets from, since I was a kid. Yeah. And I could combine my... My uh, my um, my love in a way for programming and math and physics and then planets together into what I'm working on today. And your mother was reading to you about different planets. Yes, that was back in the 1980s. There were no exoplanets, but uh, a lot of the planets had been uh, had been explored by the Voyager missions and by missions to Mars and Venus and so on. Mm. So I do remember as a kid that I was uh, read aloud from books about different planets and that it rains acid on Venus yeah. and that it's very cold on Mars and so on. And I found it deeply fascinating. Yeah, I think all these worlds that are circling in our neighborhood mm. and we know so little about them and they are so different from the Earth and think what you could learn if you could go there and explore them be an astronaut there and when you look at space and, and, mm. uh, and the, the, the depths of universe mm. and you look inwards mm. towards your you know your, your inner depths yeah do you see any similarities there or yes i do see similarities i i i think as a physicist and as a scientist that you learn to have a lot of, of respect for nature in a way you want to understand nature by measuring or by calculating yeah but you want to understand the truth about nature mm. yeah and 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 this scientific truth uh, it's hard to know when you find it and of course you can never f you can you can search for it you probably cannot excite say that you found it or not but 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 you know in, in in natural science that there are other groups who work on the same thing and if they can get the same result then it's closer to the truth than if they do it if they get a different result so this kind of i think natural science has an obsession with with the reality mm. that, that we want to measure what really is and not what someone thinks or someone believes mm. in a way we have an obsession with the with the reality and i think this obsession with reality for me has a bit of an ethical aspect also as about the truth and a false and, and truth and false is about ethics again and i think this goes into our own identity also and what we experience uh, as we experience being human and being conscious mm. and observing uh, our, our, our uh, observing things around us and we experience love and we experience frustration and, and so on and and, uh, and 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 i think believing that this is real and believing that science is real are two ve uh, believing that nature is real from when you measure it scientifically i think these two are very related to each other in which in what sense well, in which sense uh, that I that I think that to explain it better, I, I think that in in order to to be a good scientist, mm. you have to you have to believe, you have yeah. to believe what you see, what you hear, yeah, yeah, and you have to also sometimes see something is not true, mm. you have to to look at your result and say no, there was a bug in my code, this cannot be true. The foundation is based on on on, on belief. The, the foundation is based on belief in that there is something real to measure. Mm. And once you have this belief in something real, you also automatically get something that's not real. That's the bug in your code. Mm. That's the spider on your telescope lens. <laughs> All these things. And, and, and of course, you, you, you have to also realize, no, this is not real. There's something wrong here. And this is a fascination with the reality that I think has, is, is, is deeply ethical also. And uh, when you talk with brain researchers yeah, yeah. They, they they really can't find the, the end of, yeah. of the possibilities and, yeah. and, and the depths of the human right. human brain yeah and when when i talked to you earlier yeah. Yeah. you couldn't tell me about the the end of the universe no no, no. um is there a similarity there that the, 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 the tremendous mm. possibilities mm. and and and, mm. and and ways yeah for us to expand yeah. both out there yeah. and in here yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. 
No, I, I think there's, there's a similarity in that the universe is very complex and it consists of a lot of components, just like the brain is very complex and with a lot of possibilities, right? Mm. And, 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 you know, when you, when you observe an exoplanet, if you're an, an, an observational astronomer, and, and you know how, how much mass it has and where, which star is orbiting, but you don't know anything about continents or life or grass or bacteria or anything like that. So think mm. about what you measure, maybe two numbers. You know two numbers about this exoplanet. Oh. But think about all the complexity if you go and actually visit it. Yeah. And you could map out the continents, you could measure the composition, you could understand the atmosphere, you could understand the clouds. Mm. Again, it's like with the brain, uh, there's so much complexity there, there's so many things to measure. And you grew up in Denmark. Yes. And then you go to, to Germany, yeah. to Heidelberg, yeah. famous mm. for its uh, printing pre presses. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah. and they have a great research. Yeah astronomy yeah. facility there right. as well yeah, right, right. 10 times yeah. the space we have here in yeah, Lund. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, then you go to Holland yeah because you, you make your PhD in the in the formation of planets mm -hmm. so tell us how, how does a planet how does it be created you showed me small small yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. particles yeah. of dust yeah yeah before yeah, yeah. well yeah, I can basically uh, basically show show you these again. So these are these are actually uh, in a way miniature planets created in the laboratory in in Germany. But they're not quite planets yet. They are what we would call pebbles. Yeah. So they are pebble sized. They are they are they are millimeter sized. And why are these interesting? Well, because we should think now about planets that form. We should think about a star forming. So we have a big clump of gas that collapses under gravity. It forms mm. a star in the center that starts to shine. And around this clump of gas, and some of the gas ends up orbiting around the, the newly born star. This is a disk of 99% gas and 1% dust particles. And those dust particles are much more than we're seeing here. These are actually millimeter sizes. They are, the mm -hmm. dust particles are micrometer sized. But then as they collide and stick together, then they will form something that's like a micro millimeter or maybe a centimeter, very similar to what we're seeing here. Mm. That's indeed what they're simulating in, what they are there. What they are well simulating in in the lab here is the f early early stages of planet formation, where you formed millimeter-sized pebbles mm. here. Now, what I've been very interested in my career is how to go on for millimeter sizes. This is clearly well understood how you can make millimeter-sized pebbles by colliding micrometer-sized dust. Mm. I'm interested in going beyond that, mm. and then you can't really do it in the lab anymore. You can't really experiment with meter-sized mm. <laughs> uh, dust particles anymore. So then I focus a lot on computer simulations. Yeah. Uh, you can simulate how these uh, pebbles move around in the gas. And I have understood then uh, how they get concentrated in, in, in the gas. They come into dense groups. Mm. A little bit like when you have a bicycle race. You see all the bicycle riders are riding in a, in a dense group mm. in order to protect themselves against the friction from the air. They can travel faster as a group. So the same thing happens to the dust particles. And then the gravity takes over when they come so close together. That doesn't happen in a bicycle race. The gravity mm. takes over, but in space, well, it's a lot of space. Then when the when the when the pebbles concentrate, then gravity takes over and f and, and 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 makes them forces them to form asteroid size or so one ten hundred kilometer size solid objects. Mm. So that was uh, the the content of my PhD thesis, which you're also s sitting with there. Mm. Mm. And. Then it goes on to create something even bigger. Then it goes on to, to create something even bigger. So now we, 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 we came up to maybe 100 kilometer sized asteroids. Yeah. That's what we call planetesimals sometimes. These are the building blocks of, of planets. And then in, in, we may have to imagine that 4.5 billion years ago in our solar system, all the, all the material there was in, in, in kilometer sized asteroids. Mm. And then most of them collided to form planets. In the inner solar system, we formed the terrestrial planets, so the stone planets, mm. Mercury, Venus, Earth, and, uh, and Mars. Mm. And in the outer solar system, uh, we formed the gas giant planets. So for example, Jupiter formed as a, as a solid planet, grew to 10 Earth masses. Mm. And then it, it could, its gravity could attract so much gas that it became a gas giant planet. Yeah. But then in between uh, Jupiter and Mars, there's a region where, uh, where the asteroids still survive until today. And that's because Jupiter's gravity prevented the formation of, of another planet there. Yeah. And they're looking for space out there, for, for life in, mm -hmm. in space. Mm -hmm. But in, in a way, in a sense, a formation of a, of a planet and, and, mm -hmm. the, and the, the depths of a planet mm -hmm. and the depth of a star mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. a black hole and so mm -hmm. on, that's 
a form of life as well. It's certainly complex. Uh, it can have a, a, law, a, a many, many different outcomes. Uh, so one of the things I'm very interested in is in why do some planets become gas giants or they become terrestrial planets. Some become super Earth, it's like our own Earth, but 10 times more massive. So there's certainly a lot of, of, of diversity of, of mm. outcomes there mm. and, 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 uh, and very complex. Uh, the, the question, well, why, why does one planetary system get one gas giant and another one get three? Mm. In a way, that's a very complex uh, question because it may be just a small change to the initial condition. A little mm. bit more dust, a little bit less dust can matter whether you get three gas giants or one or maybe zero. And I think this kind of, of complexity is, in a way, is a little bit similar to life. Yeah. And you were one of the pioneers in this field. Mm -hmm. you, you, you hit the hot spot yeah. from start. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about your, your, your contribution to... to uh, mm -hmm. The understanding of uh, yeah. of plants being born. Right, right. Also, when I was a PhD student, there was a lot of concern about what we call the, the meter barrier. That was how to grow beyond a meter in size within planet formation. And I was lucky to be among a, a group of people at that time who who proposed uh, a, a, the solution where where it's not about sticking anymore. It's not about getting these these particles to stick past the meter barrier anymore because they are they are not going to stick to each other once they are this size. Mm. But actually, that we thought no, it must be about gravity. Uh, let, let's use gravity instead. Let's get them to concentrate together in the in the gas, and then let's gravity do do the job because once gravity is forcing these pebbles together, they they don't have to stick anymore. Mm. So it was a it was a solution that, that people were working on at that point and which I think became more and more necessary because of the exoplanets. We knew at that point there were exoplanets around most other stars. Yeah. So we had there had to be a good explanation for how to form planets. It could not we could not have any major bottlenecks in the growth any, any, anywhere. So it, it, it was it was a good timing also with the exoplanet observations. And you're forty years old now. So you have mm. three decades left. Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, what will be your magnum opus? Well, I would like to be able to really explain how to form a whole planetary system, not just mm. a single planet. So I hope 30 years from now, if we meet again, that I, I could show you a, a big computer program where, where, where I will allow you to click go, mm. and then we would wait for a few minutes, and then we would see how a whole star formed, a whole disk mm. of gas and dust uh, swirls around and how we could turn into different planets. And then I would like to show you how to make different planetary systems. How do you make one with one gas giant? How do you make more Earth's planets? How do you make no planets or something? So, whatever. so that we could really understand what are the reasons why so planetary systems look so different. Mm. Mm -hmm. Be because you can't see the planets. No, uh, we can't see the planets. Oh, so there was, the way around other stars. No, the way astronomers find planets around other stars is by a by what called indirect methods. It means that we don't see the light from, from from the planets. You have to imagine that if this is the star here and the planet is orbiting around, so we want to see the planet. This is the star. Then the star, when you take a photo of the star, it feels so much uh, on the CCD chip that that, that the, the the light of the planet is completely drowned out. You are never going to see it that uh, that way. What people do instead is that they focus on measuring the motion of the star, mm -hmm. because as the planet moves around the the star, the planet also exerts a gravity on 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 the star, and that makes the star move a little bit. So now I'm going to remove the planet since you don't see it. Now you're just going to see the star doing this mm -hmm. with maybe one. 10 meters per second moving forward and back, forward and back, forward and back. Mm -hmm. And now this is also impossible to, to measure. If you just look at it, you're not going to see the, 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 the star move around. But if you look at the light from the star, then you can analyze the light and you can see that it's systematically moving towards you and away, towards and away, towards and away. And this gives you the mass of the planet and the orbit of, of the planet. And that's how most exoplanets are in fact found. Mm -hmm. We don't see the planet itself. We just look at the star and we say the way the star behaves, there must be a planet. That typically gives you the mass, uh, the orbit of the planet, maybe the radius of the planet, but that's about all we know. So these are really like three parameters. Imagine the Earth was just three parameters, and we mm. know how complex the Earth is. Mm. So that's how little we know about these planets. And the founding fathers of astronomy, they, they, they know even less, but yeah. they, they were as curious as you are, perhaps. Yeah. Yes. And and the first ones were perhaps the, the farmers who wanted yeah. to... to uh, 
explore uh, mm. which weather yeah. was coming. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think the motivation for astronomy started out with the motivation to have a good calendar. Mm. Once we became a farming culture in Europe, you want to know when to harvest, you want to know when to put, when to, when to harvest, when to, when, when, when to sow your seeds and so on. And then it became necessary to know a calendar, simply know what time of, 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 of year that you have. And I think this led to a, a profession where some people would, would, would look at stars and simply say, now it's three weeks until it's good to, uh, to sow your seeds and so on, because then you know what time of, of year it is. And that's where astronomy more or less came out from and became, mm -hmm. was a, a necessary science in a way, simply for having a, a, a farming culture and knowing the wheel of time yeah. for, uh, every year. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then who, who were the, the first... Uh, before Tycho Brahe, yeah. which were the, the first star? Well, you can name, you can mention that but there were many. Obviously, one of the big stars was was Hipparchus, who lived in in, in ancient Greece, and he uh, made a, made the first star catalog. So he measured all he could see around two thousand stars mm -hmm. on the night sky. He the same as now. Around. Same as now. He measured exactly where they are, and he also measured how bright they were. So he also made a a category of brightness from one to five. One is the brightest and five was the, was the, the, the least bright. Mm. Uh, and of course, he had no astrophysics. He did not know what stars were, but he, he had an interest in the night sky. He measured these stars very, very carefully. Mm. Mm. And then came the Swede. The Swede, the, the Dane. Super the Swede. Dane. Yeah, the Dane, the Swede. <laughs> the, the, we, we're, we're brothers now. Yeah, exactly. The Swedes and Danes. Exactly. Uh, Mm. We took credit a bit there, yeah, but um, yeah, yeah. tell us about Tycho Brahe. Okay, he was so, a bright so man. He was a very bright man, and uh, Tycho Brahe was excellent at uh, measurements. So he had very good measurement measurement devices, and he could measure the positions of stars to very good precision. He was also unique in that he uh, introduced modern measurement method. He would measure the position of a star five times and take the average mm. and say that is a better value now than, than, than the five measurements. So he was very good with error statistics and so on. Um, and he was also, uh, uh, he was really a modern scientist. So he did not base his arguments on, on religious beliefs or philosophical beliefs. He based his arguments on what he could measure. An example of which is actually a case where Tycho was wrong, that he thought that the Earth was the center of, 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 of the universe. But it wasn't just that he thought it because he liked it, mm -hmm. but he said if the Earth is orbiting around the Sun, then the position of the star must change over the course of a year because we're seeing the star from different angles. Just yeah. like if you take out your finger and look at it with two different eyes, one eye is closed, the other eye is closed, you see that the position of the finger changes relative to the background, and that's called the parallax. And that's telling you that, that, that basically uh, telling you that 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 that, that the distance to to the finger, given the distance between our two eyes, and imagine that our two eyes is now the the Earth at uh, uh, in one part of the orbit, and half a year later, mm -hmm. then the stars would also have to change position if the Earth was moving. Since he could not measure this position shift, and he thought of himself as the greatest astronomer alive, mm -hmm. he said, <laughs> since I don't see this shift in the position. That means that the stars. That means that the, the Earth must be standing still, and must be the center of the universe, and the Sun orbiting around the Earth. Now, of course, we know today that the, that he was wrong. The Earth does revolve around the the, the Sun. What he was wrong about was that uh, the stars are actually so far away that even if the Earth is orbiting around the Sun, you don't see this shift in the positions of the stars. It was only 300 years later it was possible to to uh, to to, uh, to measure this. But he used uh, he used scientific arguments to back up what 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 he thought. He, he did not mm. use religious of or philosophical arguments. But we can't see the outer lines of universe. No. So then we can't then we can't determine whether the Earth is the center of the universe. No, that is true. We cannot determine that, and that's in a way that's a limit to science. Also, so perhaps we'll, Tick was <laughs> right anyway. He could be right. We don't know if life is only on Earth. Mm. Maybe a hundred years from now, we know life only arose on Earth, and then we could think again that the Earth was something special. Mm. That, that 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 there was a a coincidence that made life appear on Earth, or that there was a deliberate action by something or someone to make life here. And we covered all the, the white spots on Earth, yeah. so, so we're lucky as humans that we have some mm. white spots out there. 
I think we're lucky. Uh, I think we need that as humans. I think we are having our brains also to explore. Mm. I think we explored and expanded all our life, and it's only really in the last few hundred years that, that all the white spots on Earth have, have been gone. Mm. But it's, it's waiting a little bit now with exploring the solar system and, and colonizing the, the, the solar system. But, but, the, but I think that must be a natural next step now. Yeah. And then my, 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 my hero, mm. Elon Musk, <laughs> he's, he's doing that. Yeah. And he's changing the game. Disruptive. Yeah. Um, tell us about what, what's your view of what happened. I'm not an expert on, on exploration of the solar system, but my view is that it's possible to colonize another planet. I think one one will have to take risks, hmm. and, and and probably some people will will die in the process of of colonizing Mars. But there doesn't seem to be anything holding us back except for conservatism that we want to want to stay on Earth. Hmm. But I think, uh, philosophically, I think it would be very healthy for us uh, if Elon Musk or another company or government agency can make a bar- m- base on another body like the Moon or the Earth. I think it would satisfy us uh, as, as humans to know that we're still expanding outwards. Yeah, yeah. because we, we, we have become a bit limited here on Earth. I think we have, and I think we have, and I, and I think the risk is also if we don't expand that we are going to go a little bit crazy. Yeah, expand or die. Expand or die, or, or expand or... Or go crazy. I, yeah. I, I, I would say I think it's healthy for us. And uh, you, you, you also believe that you could go further in Mars. You could continue. The I, th- exploration. I think once you would learn to colonize Mars, you would have learned to get water out of ice. You would have learned to create oxygen out of water. You learn to grow crops on an, on, 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 on on a planet with no life on it. Once you have solved these problems, then I, you could go anywhere. You would go to an icy asteroid. Mm. like Ceres. It's a mm. very nice icy asteroid. As long as you have ice available, and if you go to the outer solar system, rock and ice are equally abundant. So mm. you could go to any moon of Jupiter or Saturn and you could live there. And I think it will open up for a ton of possibilities of where humans could live. And one of the possibilities is, is uh, space mining. Yeah. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah. These beautiful metals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's actually very interesting because you, you show me this meteorite here. So this is a bit of a special meteorite here because it comes from an asteroid that did not differentiate to form a core and a mantle. So we know on Earth that most of the metals are now in the core. That's where the iron and nickel and a lot of the other metals are sitting inside of, of the core on, 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 on Earth. And that's also why certain elements like platinum are so rare here. But if you go to an asteroid that uh, did not form a core, and this is actually a, a fragment of such an such an, 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 an asteroid, so the black out here is mm-hmm. simply that it became very hot when it went through the Earth's atmosphere. But you look inside it here, you see little pieces of rock that are, uh, that are sitting here, which we think are maybe the pebbles that formed asteroids. These rocks have, have, the, have the, a primitive composition, we call it, it's that they have all the iron, they have all the nickel, they have all the, the platinum, they have everything in them because nothing has escaped in, into the core here. Mm. I mean, if you could bring down to Earth a whole asteroid with this composition here, you would really have a lot of very, very valuable uh, elements with you also. Mm. Mm. So uh, space, space mining. Is there anything else we can do out there besides making love and, and uh, yeah. war and laughter? I think we can do a lot of that. I think we can go there and, 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 and colonize, and there would probably be wars and crises and poetry and as what humans always do yeah uh, right and, and uh, indeed we can find resources out there and i think uh, colonizing the solar system is possible it will be hard but possible i think the next step is going to be even harder that's going to be to go to a planet around another star and how should we do that yes we shall uh, first of all we need to uh, figure out how fast you can fly mm. because we might live with sitting there for 10 years. We have to call George Lucas. We have to call George, George, George Lucas. The issue is the speed of light. So even going to the new star at the speed of light would take four years. And going mm. accelerating to the speed of light is not possible at all now. Maybe we could, as many years from now, we could develop maybe fusion drives that could go 10% of the speed of light. Mm. But then still it would be 40 years minimum to go to the nearest star. Mm. So then we have to think about extending our life Span. We have to think about sending robots and fertilized eggs. Going to freeze. Going to freeze. Yeah. 
one has to really think about these kind of, of, of things. And of course, we have to be able to identify a good planet to go to first. Mm. I would not travel four light years in space to go to Mars. <laughs> you have to go to a planet, hopefully, where there's life already, oxygen in the atmosphere and so on. Mm. It would be a little bit boring to go so far, only to live in, 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 in big domes and be uh, depending on, on technology to, uh, to survive. Mm. So I think part of, of, of the exploration of exoplanets is also to find good planets that you could possibly live on also. Mm. It's a, it's a amazing, but but there won't be any planets that's called uh, Anders. Uh, you want some because no, you, you give them quite boring names now. We tend to give them telephone numbers, names. So yeah. uh, that's because stars have telephone numbers, as we call them. There's a star called HD two hundred nine four five eight, and around that is a planet that's called HD two hundred nine four five eight b. And that's how astronomers know the planets is a little b after the, 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 the star name. Uh, occasionally, planets are named, and, and the International Astronomical Union do name planets also. Uh, but unfortunately, the names are not always used. Mm. Um, so there are a lot of planets have names, but they are more likely to be referred to by their telephone number, so, so to say, this long uh, 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 code number. I, I I think having names for planets that people use is probably going to wait until we have a usage for the planets, right? Mm. Once 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 we know more about the planets, once we have plans to go there and so on, I, I think we're going to get rid of the telephone numbers and replace them with the real names. But then, of course, there are lots of planets out there. Then, then we can all get a planet with, with our name on it. So. Yeah. Luckily, mm. we have Jupiter and, and Mars and mm. all these beautiful names. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there... You have a, a daughter who is six years old yeah. and she's getting into the, yeah. the interests of space yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. How can we excite our youngsters yeah. for, for astronomy? Well, I think it's maybe not about astronomy, it's about exciting for innovation, natural sciences, engineering, for, for going into thinking about, for, 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 for interest in working on solving big problems, so to say, right? And, and, and my experience with having a five-year-old and a six-year-old, uh, or my, my daughter who turned six recently, you may have a similar experience, is that this curiosity that they display at, at that age, if you can maintain that curiosity, then, then you, you become can, professor. Or become Elon Musk. Yeah. Right? If you yeah. can maintain that, that curiosity, always asking questions, always asking big picture. And of course, they don't care where the money comes from that puts uh, food at the table or something. They they don't care about bills or mm. uh, about boring things. <laughs> yeah, they, they only care about big picture. Yeah. And I think for most of us in life, later on, one cares more about working to to make money and so on. Uh, but, but but I think it's important that that. Uh, that so we limit ourselves. I think we do that. I think we are in a society where where this kind of questioning wears off. We start caring more about relations mm. and about football, maybe or mm. maybe other things, right? Uh, and I think for a lot of people, it wears off. It does not wear off for the true geek. Mm. Uh, so if if one can maintain this geek culture throughout life, that's a typical way of 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 of, of, of becoming a, a a scientist later on. And I think I think it really is about the, this personality when you're five, six, seven years old. This kind of always question everything. If one can maintain that, I think one one can really uh, start focusing on solving society's big problem and big challenges yeah. in the future. Yeah, and and. You went out there. You went to America and mm. to to Japan mm. to to make uh, mm. studies on mm. on, on planets. Yeah. Tell us about. And you're living now in Sweden, yeah. but you're religion from from Denmark. Yeah. So you've been living an international life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Different countries, yeah, yeah, different yeah. planets, yeah, yeah, different yeah, yeah, worlds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how has that been? It's been amazing, I would say. Uh, it's been very interesting to get to know different cultures and how people think in different countries. It's, it's surprisingly different even within Europe. Mm. Many different between Denmark, Sweden, Germany, Holland. Uh, on, on the other hand, also, if you work among physicists or among astrophysicists, you also have a very big shared culture. Mm. Even if you're from Japan or South America or, or the US, People are, in a way, quite similar in, in their way of thinking, that they think a lot about the big picture of science and they, they think a lot about the future and they think a lot about how to improve ma mm. mankind on, on Earth and, 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 and so on. So I, I think the whole scientific culture, international scientific culture, actually is a very similar culture, even if people come from a different backgrounds. Mm. And today we have 10,000 Astronomers. Yeah, approximately. Uh, that that could be, you know, 
quite a small number if mm. you think about we have a population of several billion people. Yeah, 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 it's true. There's only 10,000 that are looking yeah. outwards, yeah, so yeah, to yeah. say. Yeah. Would, it, would, would it change, you think, or, or is it enough with one man like Elon Musk to make everything yeah. disruptive? Yeah, I, I think it depends on what society needs. So astronomers, astronomy needs funding. Mm. To give people, people don't work for free. They need to have a salary and so on. And the funding into astronomy comes a lot from the motivation, I think, of 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 exploring. We want to explore the universe, and understand it better. It's also very much because of technology that astronomers develop telescopes and uh, spaceships and so mm. on that are uh, or, or space telescopes, I should say, that that benefit a lot of companies and a lot of people get. A lot of companies contribute to building these instruments, and then these companies develop expertise that allow them to compete better at the world market and so on. Um, so, so I I think that that there, there could be ten times more astronomers if society thinks this is important. Mm. I think it's going to rise in the future because we're also seeing the global wealth rising. We see, see countries like India and China are increasingly funding uh, basic science also. So mm. I think that there will be more astronomy in the future also. And, and, and certainly we will not run out of planets anytime soon to, to explore. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you, we have the, space, we have the Hubble telescope yeah. out in space. Yeah. And you've been in, uh, in the telescopes in, in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And there are some big ones in, in Chile yeah, as well. Yeah. Tell us about these telescopes. Amazing, amazing uh, yeah. instruments. Yeah, it's really driving astronomy that you can observe. The bigger the telescope, the, 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 the higher the, the, the resolution. So that's really something that's, the, that's the driving. Uh, They're 35 astronomy. meters in diameter. Yeah, so some of the big ones now that are being built are more than 30 meters in, 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 in size. So there's a general tendency in astronomy now that we need big telescopes. Mm -hmm. People don't use the medium-sized telescopes so much anymore. Mm. And the really big ones to know about is then the, the Keck telescopes on Hawaii, the VLT telescope in Chile uh, are the kind of biggest ones on, on, on the Earth. And then there are the, the 30 meter class telescopes that are being built now and, and 10 years from now they will be uh, active. But then also there's a, uh, there's a tendency to send uh, telescopes into space where the Earth's atmosphere doesn't disturb anymore. There's a Hubble mm. Space Telescope with a general observe. Where you point it, you can observe. There are also more, more uh, specific purpose telescopes like the Kepler telescope that NASA sent up in 2009 that looked only for, for exoplanets. Mm. And there are several other telescopes of that kind that are orbiting around Earth now that are, that are, that are targeting a specific science question. Uh, how many exoplanets are there? Or where are all the stars in the galaxy? And so on. But you can use the, the telescopes on Earth as well with laser Yes. in order to correct the right. atmosphere. Right, right. So you shoot a laser up through the atmosphere, you look at the reflected light from the laser, and how that laser light is then distorted by the atmosphere, you can uh, then see that must be the same way that the, st that the light from a star has been distorted by the atmosphere, and then you can compensate for it by changing the shape of, of the telescope. Mm. So it's called adaptive optics, and, and this is also used, and will be used also on future telescopes, so that the atmosphere is not so disturbing anymore. Is there any bright stars now in the world in astronomy? There, do you have any? It's, it's become more like a collaborative uh, thing, I would say, where you have very big projects, where you have a lot of people who are working on it. So it's maybe not, not so possible to be a Tiger Bride today mm. as it was 500 years ago, when there were only a handful of astronomers all over the world. So it's become more collaborative e effort. But occasionally you also, you, you, you do have people who single-handedly make, ma make a difference. I mentioned the discovery of the exoplanets in the mid 1990s by the Swiss. There were two Swiss astronomers who, who wrote a paper saying, "Okay, we found the first exoplanet." I think this is an example of where where a small handful of people actually have, have opened up a, a whole new new research area. We saw recently the discovery of the first gravitational waves, so the the coalescing black holes that produce gravitational waves. That was. A big collaborative effort, but again, there were a few people who had driven this question for decades and decades and decades. So it's still possible to make a difference, but it's very often now that there's a big team effort in it also. Yeah. We're not alone anymore as Tiger Brahe was. And in between us here and him, we had some, we had Galileo. Yeah. Which were the bright ones in the last hundred years? Well, if you start with Tiger Brahe, he's kind of the start of the scientific revolution. He's in the a way. mother, founding father. Yeah, really, the astronomy. founding father. Because afterwards, you have uh, Johannes Kepler, mm. who is uh, 
able to look at Tycho's data and then uh, he can say that actually this planets move around the sun in, in, in ellipse orbits and not circular orbits and move around the, the, the sun. And then comes the kind of real step towards modern science, that is when Isaac Newton, he uses his law of gravity to, to actually derive the, uh, the Kepler uh, uh, orbit. He uses mathematics to go from gravity and show that this means that planets must orbit around the sun in, in elliptical orbit, just like Kepler had, had, had seen. And that is really the foundation of modern astronomy and, all, and also modern physics to, to, a, to, to a great degree, that you have a theory and you have observations and, and you try to, to match, the, you, 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 you test the theory against all observations and only if you get an exact match is when you declare success. Mm. Mm-hmm. And uh, how to make a great team if you want to make a Nobel Prize winning uh, uh, yeah. research team. Right, right. Uh, what, who, how do you, how, what, what do you force on that? I think you need people with a passion. Mm. You need people who, who really love what they're working on. Mm. And you need people who can think out of the box, but that comes from, typically from the passion also, that you think out of the box, you think original thoughts. Mm. Um, so so, and so you, you need people who, even if they are not the team leader, I think you need people who are, who are really driving and who really want to see a certain direction and then they have the vision to go and the team leader can play an important role there of course but I think it's important that, that, that the people who, who, who participate that they share a similar vision ah. and uh, what, what business life what you would think we can learn from, from uh, researchers and, and uh, astronomers for businesses yeah what, what, what's, mm. what's, what's, the, what's the lessons we can we can learn and, and uh, mm. We have a short horizon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With, with, uh, I think you can learn to think far, uh, like people like Tukobar, uh, not, not just think here now, but actually th- really take a look at the big questions and, 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 and the big answers and so on. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, 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 and the long investment, in a way, I mentioned couple of times the Swiss astronomers who found the first exoplanets yeah. they were developing instruments for 10-15 years earlier to measure the the velocity of stars to very high pr- precision be patient and 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 and, and think 10 to 15 20 years into the future sometimes also not just one year into the future not just when can I publish the next paper the next paper sometimes you really have to think oh now I want to build this new instrument or this new theory and it's going to take a while but mm-hmm. I know where I'm going and I'm going to keep going I know there'll be something good there. I think you need this kind of, of, of thinking over, over over long time scales also. And uh, is there any lessons that we can learn? Because we have we have in Sweden we have the, the Wallenbergs, mm, mm, uh, mm. Newton Alice Wallenberg Foundation, yeah, is yeah, founding yeah. your mm, research mm. quite a lot. Yeah. But but uh, there seems to be a shorter horizon. Yeah. Is there any more lessons you think the, the integration between mm. business life and yeah. and, uh, and science and yeah. res- researchers mm. w- when they merge mm. two supernovas right, right. like Elon Musk? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. He's, he's kind of merging these areas. I, I, I think a common denominator here is to think far ahead, to think 10 years. Don't think about what you make money on tomorrow, but think 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. I think that's indeed what the, what the Wallenberg family have always been great at. Mm. That they 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 invest they make investments that's going to pay off over a long time scale, mm. and the way that they fund fund science is typically also that they that they 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 they, they, they fund the excellent science projects that are becoming that will benefit humanity over a long time scale and not necessarily what what produces something tomorrow. Mm. I think that's the, I think that, that 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 that's the lesson why I think it's similar between business and science. That yeah, yeah, yes, in business you can you can focus on 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 running a surplus this year or or, or on or next quarter. In science you can focus on publishing the next paper a mm. month from now. But it's important to be able to think ten years into the future also and see where do I want to go? What's really going to benefit me and society most? Mm. And, and then you might get a completely different answer. And. Uh, in space, you can often anticipate the future. Yeah. You can you can see that it will turn into a mm. supernova. Yeah, and, yeah. And okay. Do you think you can take some lessons from, from that field mm. as well? Yeah, because uh, scientists often think about what's going to happen, mm. right? And, 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 and think about how things are evolving and what they're turning into. 
again, that's another example, I guess, of thinking a little bit further ahead and, and thinking about origin and end is a typical scientific question, right? Mm. You have an object, you ask yourself, how did it form? How is it going to end its life? Mm. That's a very typical scientific process in, in, in a way, but that, that automatically gives you this kind of big picture, a big question also, right? Mm. Is there any differences between researchers in, in, in Japan and the yeah. US, in Denmark, Sweden, Holland, Germany? Mm. What do you think is the cultural I think we sort of share a lot of, of have a lot of shared values. That, 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 that once you study the same topic at university and so on, you you're typically quite similar in a way. There's a little bit different working culture in different countries, where in some countries, particularly the U.S. and in Japan, people have very long work hours. Uh, on the other hand, my experience with working there is also that people take it more relaxed when they're at work. They have more breaks, they have more fun. Mm -hmm. They go out to eat lunch for a long time with their colleagues and so on. And I think in Scandinavia, we are probably more used to a shorter working week now, but we're also used to running fast now, right? That you've got to do it all in mm. 40 hours <laughs> so mm. people run faster. So I th I, my experience is that, that people, I, I think the human brain has a certain capability of, of work every day. And whether you work 60 hours or 40 hours a week, it's the same amount of, of productivity. Because you could you could squeeze it into a shorter time and be more stressed, or you could take it into a longer time, but it's about the same amount of, of productivity. And and uh, when you want to reach the, the your 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 own limits, mm. you know, in productivity yeah. and in, in, yeah. in yeah. creativity, yeah. what would be your advice for that? How do you create an environment for yourself yeah. that you kind of mm. deliver on 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 top? You have to allow yourself to relax and stop, and you have to. Uh, you have to allow yourself time for, for thinking also, mm. taking a, a walk, thinking, letting the brain relax, sitting on a plane, just relaxing. I, I, I think you cannot push yourself. You don't get more creative if you push yourself more and more. Thinking but, fast, thinking slow, like yeah, the book. Yeah, exactly. You have to sometimes sit down and think about the big picture. This can be fun, actually, when you apply for research grants, where you typically have to give a five-year plan. That can be very healthy, actually. Mm. You don't. You can speculate what you want to do for five years. And mm. of course, when, once you get the money and you do it, you do so you realize you can't exactly do what you thought. But still, it's very healthy for the brain to relax a little bit on, on, on the details. And just kind of plan ahead. Mm. Again, Elon Musk, right? Or what, mm. what do I want to do in the next five years? What do I want to do in the, in the next 10 years? Is there any other inspiration with people besides Elon Musk in the world? There seems to be a lack of, of uh, superheroes today. Yeah, you can say that. Um, uh, you had, you, had, uh, yeah. you know, the, the founding fathers of... of, yeah. of no, there, there's, of course, a little bit of, of lack. You can say you often... Steve sometimes, Jobs occasionally, you have politicians like, like Barack Obama, who can be very inspiring. But, but, of course, politicians' work is often very temporary. Then the politician comes from the opposite part and destroys everything. Mm. <laughs> it's a little bit depressing, really, right? Yeah. Uh, so occasionally you see it from, 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 uh, from the politics. Uh, but, 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 but you can say a lot of the companies are driving now. You say Google are developing artificial intelligence. Mm. There's a lot of talk about mining asteroids and so on. It seems that some of the most... Some of the most open-minded thinkers are sitting in, in companies very, very often now, right? Whereas politicians are thinking about the, the next election, yeah. so to say. In Silicon Continue. Valley that holds the, the big ideas. Yeah, yeah exactly. The big, exactly. Yeah. Your, only, your own daily routines, mm -hmm. how do they look like? Oh, uh, okay. You go to bed quite early. Yeah, I get up at six typically and I feel tired. I don't like getting up early, but I have two kids who so have to go to, to school. And when they are in school and I'm here at 8.30, then I feel the worst part of the day is over, the most stressed part of the day. Yeah. Uh, then, uh, then when I work, it feels relaxing. I don't, and then nothing can compare to bringing two kids to school in, no. in, <laughs> in, the, the, in the morning. But then I typically stop working at around 4.35. Then I go home and with the family again, mm. make some, cook some dinner, clean after the dinner, and then I go early to bed. So, so my, my main focus now is work and family. Mm -hmm. And and how do you make your your your, your days fruitful mm. here at work? Yeah, that, that's that's. How do you mine the yeah. most out of them? Right, right, right. I, I mean, it, it can be hard because there are a lot of meetings, a lot of administration, and so on. Uh, I don't have to. Uh, I don't do as much research as I used to do, but I now I have a ton of postdocs and PhD students that are supervising. I think working with people who are in a different career stage where they have more time gives me time also in a way. As I know I can talk to a, a good postdoc for half an hour and, and they can think about it for a week and come back to me. So then, then it's like 
having more brain capacity in a way. Uh, so, so I think for me, this is the most efficient way to 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 keep on working creatively is that working with the, with the young people. Yeah. yeah. And the new supercomputers and, and uh, mm. artificial intelligence, mm. will that help exploring the universe? Uh, yes, supercomputers do help us a lot. So we can simulate more and faster now than we could uh, 10 years ago, for, for example. So that does help, help a lot. Uh, and, 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 and gives new answers to questions you couldn't even dream about answering many, many years ago, so certainly. Because you have you have billions of, you said you have a hundred billion stars. You have a hundred billion stars in, in, in this galaxy. galaxy. Mm -hmm. In this galaxy. Alone. And then you have like a hundred billion galaxies. Yes, yeah, so there are many galaxies out there and many stars, yeah. So you, have, you, you will have work for, for eternity. Pretty much, there could yeah. be astronomers working for for eternity. Uh, I would say so. There's tons of things to to explore out there. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Warm thank you, yeah. and the best of luck with with all the stars. <laughs> thank you too. Inwards and outwards. Thank you too. Thank you for a great day. Yeah. And and the the heaviness of asteroids. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah.